Good evening, everybody. Are you ready? It's going to be a dangerous sermon. Uh, before I get to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, matter of fact, let me take, invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel in chapter 11, that's on page 380 of a seatback Bible. You're going to be sure to uh, follow with me as we go through a couple of chapters tonight in 2 Samuel, and we'll be there in a moment. But I, I've got a special request, grateful for everybody in the house tonight. We've got some old friends back tonight. Glad you guys are here and online out there, and so people are tapped in uh, on the radio right now, all that kind of stuff. So I, I know we got the right people uh, listening but I, I, I want to ask us to pray for a special blessing tonight on a specific person who needs to be blessed. There's somebody I'm thinking of very specifically that I believe that the Lord needs to reach out of heaven and bless him, and so we're going to pray for our friend who, for whatever reason, I don't know why anybody would do this, but two days ago at 5.30 in the morning, this friend of ours that we're going to pray a blessing on him, a blessing, decided to come to our parking lot and take the cover off all of our parking lot lights and do this. Oh, that's a blessing. Now, I don't know how God's going to make that turn into something good, but somebody came here, took off the cover. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll just be honest. I'm 66 years old. I never would think of doing this. Take off the cover, pull out a bunch of wires, and just start cutting them off. And then go to another pull, another pull, another pull, another pull. And to do that, you say, well, why are you telling us? Well, because you're going to be out in the dark tonight when you go home. <laughs> and you say, why are we in the dark? Aren't we paying our electric bill at Church ran out of money. Oh, no. Somebody blessed us. You know what's good about that? We can fix that. I'm sure some electrician will take him like 10 minutes, oh, not 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> we can fix it, right? But whoever did that needs to be fixed by Jesus. And like I said, I don't know. Maybe he was, I don't know. But we're going to pray a blessing on him. How does that sound? He said, well, you can't play a breath blessing on him. You've got to play, pray judgment on him. Like, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Get even with him. Now, what I know about that guy, what I know, I assume it's a guy. I don't know that for sure. But what I know, he's a sinner. And there's hope for sinners. Well, not a wire snipping, no good commie, somebody trying to wreck our light system in church. Oh, no, God loves him. God loves him. God loves him, right? So we can agree that probably he needs Jesus. Or else he's got a bigger problem than cutting wires. By the way, did you know any sinner anywhere can have hope with Jesus? Somebody ought to give a sermon title to that, like, Hope for Sinners. Yeah, but what about the dude that knew better? What about the dude that was blessed by God? What about somebody that had everything God could ever give to somebody and then he ends up a dirty, rotten, low-down, scumbag, bottom-of-the-barrel sinner? There's hope for sinners. Welcome to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11, and 
By the way, 2 Samuel 11 follows 2 Samuel 7. Like we saw last week, David, a man after God's own heart, David, with everything, every way you can be blessed, blessed beyond your wildest imagination. Oh, not just Goliath, not just the Philistines, not just Jerusalem, not just, you know, the tabernacle coming home. Oh, no, 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 where he wants to build God a house, and God says, no, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to make you a dynasty from you, David, forever and ever and ever and ever. The world's going to be blessed from you. The Messiah's going to come. David, you just hit the jackpot of blessing, blessing. You can't get more blessed. Get out of here, amen. And you would think that somebody that blessed would never, ever, ever just throw it all away. You would think that somebody walking with the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, writing the book of Psalms, all the songs, Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It's on page 380 of a Bible right in front of you. It happened in the spring of the year at that time when kings go out to battle that David, the most blessed man in the Old Testament, that David sent Joab and his servants with him. And all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Hey, David, you're in the wrong place. Oh, I know, but it's okay. It's not okay, David. You're not with your people. You're not doing what you should be doing. Oh, no, no, no. I'm the most blessed king of Israel. Hey, David. Oh, it'll never get me. David. Hey, David. You better get back where you're supposed to be with your people, doing what God wants you to do. Or this could be the worst chapter in the Old Testament. Oh, not my opinion. G. Campbell Morgan said this. G. Campbell Morgan said about this chapter, in the whole of the Old Testament literature, there is no chapter more tragic or full of solemn and searching warning than this. I pray that we can do some searching, receive some warning, and realize there's hope for dirty, rotten, bottom-of-the-barrel, scumbag sinners, whether you're cutting wires, or all that stuff you wouldn't tell anybody about. Can I hear amen? The power of the gospel had better come to the rescue in this chapter, or we don't have any hope. Father, I pray that tonight, as we open up a story that most of us are familiar with, I pray that we could see practical application into our lives to save us a lot of grief, a lot of sorrow, a lot of repentance, a lot of... But also, Lord, a lot of hope. And nobody's better than anybody else. You came to save sinners and to give us hope, Lord, even when at times we completely blow it. So I pray, just the authority of your word, thank you for this chapter. Thank you for David, a man after your own heart. Help us to learn, I pray. 
And Lord, I do pray. I pray a blessing on whoever it is, and maybe it's more than one guy, but I pray on whoever would sneak down here and think whatever reason I still don't understand. I pray you would bless him. I pray that somehow, Lord, his heart would be touched by your spirit. I pray that somehow radio by grace would not go off as he tries to turn it off. Whatever, Lord, that you would reach him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's our hope. Thank you, Lord, that we see a lot of people around us. And then when we look at the mirror and we see ourselves, we need a Savior. We need the Lord Jesus. So come and save us, Lord, I pray. And all of God's people would say, David's in the wrong place. He should be with God's people. He should be doing what God wants him to do. But he's, for whatever reason, he decided to stay home. By the way, be careful when you find yourself in the wrong place. You might get used to it too quick. Because then you might be doing the wrong things. 2 Samuel chapter 11. But David remained at Jerusalem. Verse 2, then it happened. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed. And he walked. The word there for walk means he's walking back and forth. He's, he can't get to sleep, so he's walking back and forth, back and forth. He walked. He walked on the roof of the king's house. He's in the wrong place. He can't sleep. I can identify with David. By the way, if you're young and you get to sleep like eight hours at a shot, you are blessed. In your 40s, that starts going away. When you're 66... You're just thankful if you sleep for like two hours. And then something wakes you up, and then you think, okay, okay, and then you go back to sleep for two hours, and then something wakes you up, and it's just the way it goes, unless you're Linda Griggs, and then you sleep all night long, but you probably don't. So, I mean, you understand. So, anyways, David, by the way, is not a young man. He's at, in the middle of his life. He's at the top rung of the ladder, if you're talking about his success, and so I don't know what kept him up, but he probably, if he was out doing what he's supposed to do, he'd be tired enough to go to sleep. But he's in the wrong place, and so he can't sleep. He gets out of bed, and like any of us, we kind of walk around, do whatever we have to do, so we'll go back to sleep. Now, what he should be doing, by the way, is he's walking around. Can I see Galatians in chapter 5? I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Can I hear an amen? So even if you find yourself in the wrong place and you can't sleep, would you make sure that when you're up walking around that you're walking around in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit? God gave us the Holy Spirit so that when we're walking around, even if we're in the wrong place, would you please walk in the Spirit, the power of God that you have as a believer so that you don't walk in the flesh? Pastor Bill, I never walk in the flesh. Yes, you do. No, I crucified the flesh, but it came back alive again. That's why I have to keep presenting your body as a living sacrifice. The living sacrifice. The problem with the living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1, it keeps coming back alive. And then you crawl off the altar, and then when you don't even know it, you're back in your flesh again. That's why every day I try to be filled with the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. And God forbid I'd ever come up to this pulpit and not ask God to fill me with the Spirit, even between first and second service. Because you can preach a sermon in the flesh. Or in the Spirit. Well, Pastor Bill, if you preach in the Spirit, you won't be growling at everybody. Oh, let's see where the text goes. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house. That's okay, wrong place. But, and from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. To behold. He
he saw a woman bathing. I have a question. What was she thinking? I mean, the palace is built up. He's up on the roof of his palace. Oh, I am not blaming her, but then I'm not not blaming her either. Without getting into too much detail, I'm married to a woman that's very, very careful. I mean, everything's shut, everything's locked, ain't nobody when she, no way! Why? Because she's godly, she's modest, she thinks of things like that. Not Bathsheba. By the way, David didn't ask for that. He didn't go looking it up on YouTube. He didn't pull out his phone and hit some porno site. He just can't sleep. But not in the place he should be. He's not walking in the spirit because, I mean, when he sees her, okay, now we got to make a decision. Now we got to make a decision. The commercial popped up. All of a sudden, the movie changed. Now all of a sudden, the billboard's right there. Now all of a sudden, and how it got on, on the phone, but there it is. And you have to make a decision. You have about a half a millisecond to make a decision. Job said it this way, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I've made a covenant with my eyes. I've made a covenant with my eyes. I shall not behold that stuff. I'm just not going to do it. David kept looking. It always starts in the brain. And if you don't shut it off, like immediately, you're already headed down the wrong road. And I know you sisters, you're not so visual as the men. That's why you have the romance novels with the hair sticking out of the guy going like this. (laughs) I get it, I get it. You need the story. We just need to see it. Well, it's true. I'm, I'm not, you know, the reason you're laughing is because you know it's true. Milliseconds. That's all you got. The sin is not what he saw. David, Guzik would say it like this. David looked at Bathsheba and said, beauty, beautiful. But God saw this story as ugly. The pleasures of sin deceive us like the bait hides the hook. We must call it what God calls it, sin. We want to say affair, but God says adultery. We want to say love, but God says lust. We want to say sexy, but God says sin. We want to say romantic, but God says ruin. We want to say destiny, but God says destruction. And you have milliseconds. Because it's coming. Just one extra little thought for you. I don't trust me. I don't trust me. I don't trust my phone. I don't trust my office. I don't trust anybody. That's why there's glass everywhere you go. That's why the first thing I do is give my phone to God. Any vehicle, any house, any computer, I give it to God. Uh, I I give Cindy complete access to that. 
I, I, even when I don't sin, I go and repent to my friends and my, especially my daughter, because everybody's sinning everywhere. It's like everybody's lost it. Well, did you? I'm, I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. I don't trust me. You say, well, I trust you. Well, then you're a fool. You say, well, Pastor Bill, what problem have you had? Well, I've had lots of problems. But by God's grace, I'm 66 years old. I have not finished my race yet. And I know way too many dudes that somehow something happens when they hit 50 or 55 or 60 or 70. They go brain dead. And then they're doing, it's unbelievable. I, okay, you get it. He saw, and there's no problem when he saw, but he's got like half a millisecond to make a decision. Turn it off. Get away. Run, David, run. Be like Joseph. So David sent and inquired, no, David, no, no, you're in the wrong place. Wrong. You don't need to be checking out her background. David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? Now, wait, wait, wait. She's whose daughter? By the way, men, she's always somebody's daughter. Eliam is one of his mighty men. She's not just somebody's daughter. She's one of your best friend's daughter. Who's out fighting when you should be fighting. She's the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. By the way, Uriah is another one of your best mighty men. Not only is she the daughter, but she's the wife. By the way, she has a husband. He's out there fighting where you're supposed to be. You've got two men that respect you. You've got two men that love you. Well, now, wait a minute. If she's the daughter of Iliam, that means her grandfather is Anhithophel. By the way, her gramps, her papa, is your chief counselor. Warning. 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 David, if you don't stop now, you're sitting against your best friend, your best friend, and your number one counselor. You've heard me say it before. I'll say it again right now. Sin will make you stupid, even if you're David, a man after God's own heart. The problem is you won't sit down and do all that math, but God gives you a way out. Even with that, God always gives you a way out. Can I hear Amen. You say, well, I don't want to take the way out. Great, well, then throw it all away. Because that's what's going to happen. You're going to throw it all away. Then David sent messengers and took her. Great. And she came to him. By the way, the way that's worded in the rest of the story, it's not like he forced her or anything. No, he invited her, he took her, and she came. She wanted to come. And he lay with her. Doggone it. No, David, no. He lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. You say, why does it throw that in there? She just got over her cycle. She just went through the cleansing ritual, which means she knows, David knows, she ain't pregnant with Uriah. Uh-uh. She just had her cycle. And she returned to her house. By the way, this didn't start with Bathsheba. This started 20 years ago when he wasn't satisfied with one wife and one another wife and then another wife. And so he somehow, I can't get no satisfaction. 
I'm not making it up. You guys know, right? You say, you dogging David? No, David's the greatest king of the Old Testament. But if somebody doesn't do something with this story, he ain't going to make it. Aren't you glad there's hope for David? You say, how much are you going to preach tonight? I got to get going. And the woman conceived. Nobody said amen. Be sure your sin will find you out. Used to be, you know, she might get pregnant was at least a deterrent against having sex anytime you want. I could go on a hobby horse and walking back through the 60s and all this stuff, and then all of a sudden you got, you know, ways to prevent whatever, or go back to 70s, and we'll just get rid of the baby. I look at Jody because she's more than anybody. We we just we wanna we wanna have our pleasure, but no consequences. Like what? She got pregnant. Oh, there's a way that God has a way of revealing sin. You need to know whether you're king or not. David and Bathsheba, under the law, should be killed. You're adulterers. Well, maybe we can figure out a way. Only with this, David's the one figuring out the way. And the woman conceived, so she went and told David, you're not going to believe this, and said, I am with child. And David said, "Mm -hmm. Then David sent for Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite, my best friend, a mighty man. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked him how Joab was doing and how the people we're doing, and how the war prospered. Uriah should have said, well, if you'd be out there with us where you're supposed to be, then you would know. But he didn't, because you know what? Uriah's a man of integrity. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. He sent him a basket. He sent him, you know, cards to go get free food. He Ubered, showed up. Not Uber. What's a grab bag thing? You know, just go home, eat, relax. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house. What? Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and he did not go down to his house. So when they told David, say, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live, as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Can I hear an amen for Uriah? A hidden guy back there? I'm I'm serving God. I'm serving my country. I'm not going to go eat Kentucky Fried Chicken with my wife. I'm not going to do it right now. I can't do that. How can I go and enjoy that? And everybody's out there sleeping in tents and their lives are on the line. No way, King. Thanks, anyways. Way to go, Uriah. And at that point, once again, David should have thought, man, this guy's a man of integrity right in front of my eyes. And he's right. It's funny thing about sin, you keep trying to figure out how to get out of it. How's it going? Now just go down there. And you say, why did that even happen? Well, because if he would have gone just one time, then everybody's off the hook because, well, it's Uriah and Bathsheba. But there was no one time. So you know what? You try to get a better scheme. Hey, Uriah, (laughs) more wine. Come to my day, more wine. Here's the good stuff. More wine. Now go home. David's running out of options. 
So what started with the glance is trying to set up her husband that won't get set up. So he has to go to plan C. He never would have dreamt at the beginning of that night when he shouldn't have been there, and he's not walking. He never would have dreamt that I'm going to have to figure out how to murder my friend. I committed adultery with his wife. There's a baby coming. I'm going to have to murder my friend. Verse 14, in the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. It's his death sentence. He sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he, he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle. Retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. How do you think Joab felt when he read that from the king? Verse 17 at the end, some of the people of the servants of David fell. Uriah the Hittite died also. Verse 24, the archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. By the way, there's other people died because of this scheme by David. Other innocent people. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messengers, thus you shall say to Joab, do not let this thing displease you. For the sword devours one as well as another. The sword devours one as well as another. That's just war. People die. I'm sorry. No, David, you're a murderer. And you know it. Strengthen your attack against the city. Overthrow it. So encourage him. Verse 26, then the wife of Uriah... The wife of Uriah, she's the wife of Uriah, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She mourned, Bathsheba mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Oh, first time God's mentioned in the chapter at the very, very end. That word displeased was evil in the eyes of the Lord. You guys don't look like you're having a very good time with the Word of God. You look like you're kind of in shock there a little bit. You might even start agreeing with Morgan. This is a vile chapter. This is bad. This is horrible. This kind of busts my bubble about David. Maybe he's the guy that cut all our wires in those poles. Do you know why you should love this story? Because your Bible's true. You're trusting what the Word of God says to you about your eternal salvation. How do you know the book's even true? When you study the people, the characters, the heroes, little H's of the Bible, and that you find out that in this book, and the only book that'll do it, that actually records the truth, and nothing but the truth about these people, and they're all sinners. You want to talk about Moses? You want to talk about Abraham? You want to talk about David? You want to talk about Peter or Paul? You take all the people of the Bible, and God tells us not only the good, but the ugly should not be repeated. Why are you saying that? Because your Bible's not written by a man trying to make David better than he is. Your Bible is written by God who tells you exactly who he is. The good, the bad, 
and the ugly because David needs a Savior even after he's been blessed. Why is this chapter in my Bible? Well, just in case you get your chest puffed up a little bit like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Oh, really? Shh. Make sure you're in the right place with the right people. Make sure you're walking in the Spirit because the flesh is right there to take you out. Oh, not me. Yes, you. Aren't you glad the story doesn't stop? Tell us the rest of the story. <laughs> well, it's pretty bad so far. You got so much bad seed of sin sown, there's going to be a whole crop that he couldn't even imagine. But somehow he thinks he dodged a bullet. By the way, you can trust what the Bible says about a Savior and about Jesus Christ. You can trust this book because this book was written by God, and every bad story in it should help you believe that. Can I hear an amen? There's no book like this book. No book like this book. Hey, Bill, tell us again what you want us to do. Can I see Galatians chapter 5? This is the key. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Can I hear an amen? Wow, David needs to get back with the Spirit. So chapter 12, it's been a while, uh, somewhere around a year, something like that, they're not sure for sure, that Nathan, here comes the prophet, and God's asked him to go tell David some news by way of a parable. So Nathan shows up, and he's figured out a way to talk about this one poor guy that's only got one little lamb. This lamb is like his pet. He loves his lamb. He loves his lamb. And then there's this rich dude that's got all kinds of flocks and sheep and lambs. And then this traveler comes by, and the traveler needs to eat. So the rich guy, instead of making a lamb, takes the poor guy. Well, he's only got one lamb. <laughs> and the rich guy takes the, the one lamb, and he kills it and feeds the traveler. So Nathan shows up with that story. David gets really mad, like that guy should die. End of verse 4. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, oh, now he's quoting God, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. He shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you the man. What? Yeah, you just said as the Lord lives, that man should die. And that's you, David. Wages of sin is death. It's easy to judge other people until all of a sudden you're looking in the mirror and God says, you better look at yourself. We run around trying to make judgment calls on people, this group, that group, whatever. I just need to look in this mirror more. And I just keep saying, I need a Savior. Well, I might ha not have the same problems, but I have a lot of sin problems. Mostly pride. You're the man. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I know that you king over Israel, delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have. You have taken his wife to be your wife. 
You have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. He shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before, our, before all Israel, before the sun. Hey, hey, David, here's the consequences to your sin. I know you didn't think about it, but you should have ahead of time. You will reap what you have sown. And if you would have counted the cost ahead of time, you would have turned your phone off. You would have walked out of the movie. You would have gone somewhere else. If you knew what it was going to cost you. It's not a guarantee, but it is a good homework assignment. We make the young man of this staff count the cost ahead of time. You want to sleep with somebody? You want to run away and do something? Count the cost now. Start with your relationship with Christ. Start with your friendships. Start with your dad. Start with your mom. Start with your children. Start going through the list. I've got one pastor on staff right now. He got 10 pages of what it'll cost, and he's still writing. You know why? It always costs more than you think. You know why? Because sin will make you stupid. And then you think you'll get away with it. And then you'll end up more and more. And before you know it, you lost the kingdom. You lost your future. Thus saith the Lord. See, what started with the look, Guzik says it like this. If David only knew what the cost would be, what, an unwanted pregnancy? The murder of a trusted friend? A dead baby? His daughter raped by his son? One son murdered by another son? A civil war led by one of his sons? A son, Absalom, who imitates David lacks, David's lack of self-control, leading him and much of Israel away from God. It would be wise for everybody here and out there, count the cost while you can think right, walking in the Spirit, and maybe you'll remember to run and to listen to God. Better to run like Joseph than have that sermon preached to you by some Nathan speaking for God. Now, aren't you glad this story doesn't end there? You say, what about all that stuff? All that stuff's going to come true for David. There are consequences for when you sin. You say, I don't like it. Does it matter? Can I see Galatians chapter 6? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Can I hear an amen? amen. By the way, that means if I plant good seed, I'm going to get good crops. Amen, Lord, thank you. But that also means if I plant bad seed, I'm going to get bad crops. Say, so how does that all work in grace and with the Lord? God's quick to forgive. Can I hear an amen? But there's still consequences. David's got another decision to make. Verse 13. So David said to Nathan, You 
you're right. I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. For a year and nine months, I've been trying to figure this out and hide and all this stuff, but you're right. I have sinned against the Lord. You say, I want to know how that sounds. How does that sound? Because a lot of people can say, okay, I sinned. All right, get it over with. No, how did that sound when David said those words? When finally... All the covering up and all the lies and all the things and all the hope. I mean, turn to Psalms 51. We know exactly how it sounds because he wrote a song about it. Psalms in chapter 51. It's on page 690. The subtitle is A Prayer of Repentance. This is actually what David wrote when Nathan, the prophet, went to him. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desired truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me, purge me, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy. Make me hear joy. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me, Lord. Please, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Somehow, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do that. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. I'm a murderer. Deliver me from guilt of bloodshed, O oh God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud. I, I know I can sing again, Lord, of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. That word for contrite means to collapse, a heart that collapses, to crush down, to crush to pieces. Here's my heart, God. Will I sing again? Will I have joy again? By the way, that wasn't a quick write for David. He didn't just... You know, in 20 minutes, sit down, and now everything's solved. You have to understand, all of the year, year and nine months, you're the man. Can I hear an amen for Psalms 51? Sounds like there might be hope for David. Yeah, there's hope for sinners. Sinners can have hope. You say, well, it ended pretty bad there. Well, it kind of gets worse in a, in a way. 
Well, no, not in a way. It actually does. Verse 12, or I'm sorry, verse 13 of chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, verse 13. Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. Can I hear an amen? The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife, notice it's not David's wife, it's Uriah's wife. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. David fasted, went in, and lay all night on the ground. That continues on for seven days. And finally the child dies. He is dead. Verse 22. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now the child, but now, excuse me, verse 23, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? What can I, can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. That's a key verse in your Old Testament. That's actually a key verse in your Bible. That his child was taken, he lost his little baby boy. Somewhere around one to two years of age. And David said, I can't bring him back, but I shall go to him. He shall not return to me. That's actually a reference to where in your Bible, in the Old Testament, David's writing to where he, the child's not lost. I'm going to go find my child. I will go to him. There's hope in the future. I'm going to go to him. I messed it up, messed up his life, I messed up my kingdom. It's all going to come down but I'll go find him. And David's got insight that you can't find anywhere else. Amen? You say, well, this is a really bad story. It is a really bad story. But there's hope for sinners. You say, well, something's going to have to turn around because all that's going to come true. All of that's going to come true. Verse 24, though, look at what happens. Verse 24, then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. Wait, 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 wait. She's never called Bathsheba his wife ever. It's always Uriah's wife, Uriah's wife. But then in the word of God with the Holy Spirit inspiring it, then gave David comfort to Bathsheba's wife. Can I hear an amen? You say, that's a bad marriage. I know it's a bad marriage. It had a really bad start. It's got a holy ending. You say, you can't have a holy ending. It has a holy ending. How can that be true? God's grace. God's strength, God's mercy, God's love can take any sinner anywhere and restore them, even though they're paying a price for their sin that they can't get around. Are you tracking with me? Amen. David comforted Bathsheba. His wife went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and she called his name Solomon. Can I hear you say Solomon? Dun, da 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 why are you doing that? He's the one that's going to replace David. His name means peace. If you only knew in 40 years in Amarillo how many marriages, how many sins, how many adulteries, how many messed up stories I've watched with dear friends that you wouldn't put a dollar, you wouldn't put a dollar on it. And you don't even know you're sitting in church with some of them that God has blessed them and blessed them and blessed them and blessed them, and they're examples of God's grace. There's always hope for sinners. Always. She bore a son, called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. Get a hear name, amen. The Lord loved Solomon. He loved him. It's, I mean, it's like, I'm sure that's with my grandson Benjamin, too, that my daughter just had. The Lord loves him, but Solomon specifically. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedediah because of the Lord. And Jedediah actually being beloved of the Lord. You can call him Solomon, peace, but I'm going to call him Jedediah because I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. 
Well, what happens after a story like that? I mean, I mean, it's really bad, but it has a really good ending. Well, David's got to write another song. He's got to write another song. It's time to write another song. So he wrote Psalms chapter 52 or 51. No, excuse me, Psalms 32. Excuse me, I got it mixed up there. Psalms 32. Turn to Psalms 32. David's ready to write another psalm. A joy, the joy of forgiveness. Psalms 32. Verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Yes. Whose sin is covered. Yes. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and valiantly was turned uh, vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin. I acknowledged my sin. I confess my sin. John, First John 1, 9. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Can I hear an amen? He's, this is a song. Uh, For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in the flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall, you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, it, you. Rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Can I hear you shout for joy? You say, I, I'm not sure. Well, if God's convicted you of something, confess it. You say to who? To him. Now, if somebody else is involved, you'll need to confess it to them. If somebody else knows about it, well, you have to get. So the best way is just confess it to the Lord. Ask the Lord to renew your heart. You know, make sure it's a contrite, broken heart. God, God wants to restore you to fellowship, sweet intimacy. First John 1 John 1.9 is there for a reason. He, wants, he loves you. He wants fellowship. He wants to bless you. There might still be consequences. But if I said, that's okay, you can still write songs and sing songs, even reaping what you sow. Amen? What's the, what's the key to this whole thing? Galatians chapter 5. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh. If we could just do that, if we would just walk in the Spirit, like when you wake up, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you before you get out of bed. And then grab your Bible, and while you read your Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you so you know what's going on. And then when you get a drink of water, ask the Holy Spirit. If it's coffee, you can use that too. But Holy Spirit, would you please control me? I write the Holy Spirit on my hand, and you say, why do you do that? I don't trust me. I don't trust me. If you only knew how many times I anoint myself with oil. I'm not bragging on it. You say, why do you do that? i I got to make sure I got the Holy Spirit. I'll do whatever I can to make sure I got the Holy Spirit. If I got the Holy Spirit, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. I'm still a basket case. I'm still a wreck, but I'll be okay. At least when I get up in the middle of the night, I'm not going to wander down the alley or something. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I'm with the Holy Spirit. I'm with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's in charge, it should work, right? I think it will work. I got this text today after prayer meeting. I mean, right after prayer meeting. And Walter told me, Walter Carlson's in our church. And we just prayed for all you guys at staff meeting. I'm praying about the sermon. I actually had the staff pray special for the sermon. Because I didn't want it to come off like, well, hey, if you only did what's right and true, you would never have this problem. We all have a sin problem. All of us. And the answer is to walk in the Spirit. Now sing your song. Walter said, hey, I've been reading the book of Romans and studying it for the last couple of three months. And I'm in chapter 8. This came at 11.05 today. I'm in chapter 8. Great chapter. All about the Holy Spirit. Just letting you know. I'm in chapter 8. 
And I listened to some of your old sermons when my voice was higher. He said, I've been listening to some of your old sermons about the book of Romans. And I was listening to how the Holy Spirit is our comforter and our helper today. And as I usually do, I run around Belmar Park three to five times a week. And the last few times I've been running, there's been this car sitting in the same spot with the same two people in it just sitting there talking. And the Holy Spirit, through your message from nine years ago, the Holy Spirit, through your message, is saying to me, let's just stop and talk to them and see if they're okay. By the way, the Holy Spirit can tell you that anytime he wants, in the middle of the night when you can't sleep. So Walter, wanting to listen to the Holy Spirit, So I did, and to my amazement, and to God's glory, I went and tapped on the window. They rolled it down, and I told them, um, the Spirit just kind of has been nudging me to stop and talk to you. I've been running out here a few times in the last week or so, and they said, that's amazing because we have just been sitting here talking about how the Holy Spirit is working right now. Yes. And you say, what do you have to do with that story? Nothing. Nothing. I don't have anything to do with that story. That sermon I preached nine years ago. I'm preaching to you now. I got a lot to do with now. What's the secret to this? Would you please walk in the Spirit? Like, Walter, would you run in the Spirit? And when the Spirit tells you to do something, go ahead and say, okay, they're probably going to shoot me, but okay, I'll do it. We were just talking about the Holy Spirit. What is this? Is God in charge? God's in charge. God's in charge. Walter goes on and he says, so we prayed. We prayed. I didn't know what to pray for them. And so the only prayer that God will provide them, I pray that God would provide them with the Holy Spirit. That's what they need. And that the Holy Spirit would guide them to where they need to go. I did invite them to the Franklin Graham event this Sunday, and I hope to see them again one-on-one uh, -on -one with one of my runs or maybe Sunday at the deal. Thank you for your encouragement. God gets all the glory. Walk in the Spirit and you don't have to worry about your flesh. If you're not walking in the Spirit, your flesh will get you every time. Be like Walter. Be like David, who realized, I need the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for the message tonight and application for all of us, Lord, with the sin that we struggle with that so easily besets us I pray that we would walk in the Spirit, take the necessary steps, Lord, to protect ourselves, show each one of us, Lord, our weakness, and how with accountability and being in the right place with God's people, I thank you, Lord, there's so much of an advantage when we gather together. Even when we don't know what's happening, there's accountability and there's love and there's, like Walter, So I thank you, Lord. Thank you for David, truly a man after your own heart. I pray we would be that way as well. We need a Savior. We need Jesus. I do pray for the Franklin Graham crusade. Lord, I pray for many, many, many people to find you as their Lord and Savior, Lord. Bless, I pray. Fill your people here tonight. Thank you that there's hope for sinners. In the great name of Jesus, God's people would say, Amen.